Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. A round of applause to Banu for his 20th anniversary tonight. Hey, congratulations. Hi, I'm Jonathan King, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at iSafe. And as Banu communicated, iSafe is a nonprofit internet safety education organization. And I'm really excited to be here from San Diego. It actually feels a lot like San Diego when I arrived today. I was a bit surprised, and, and very warm welcomed here at Spring Branch, so thank you very much. Today we're going to talk about the trials and tribulation that kids face online. I have a tendency to talk a little fast. If that's the case, just raise your hand. Say, hey, slow down, San Diego guy. And I'll make sure that happens, OK? For the first, most part, though, what we want to talk also about is not only the trials and tribulations facing online, but moreover, what is Spring Branch ISD order doing in schools to help mitigate those risks? And then lastly, of course, we're going to talk about what you can do at home to help, obviously, foster digital citizenship occurring in your houses. My background, I used to work at the FBI, where I was responsible for identifying individuals that were seducing, luring, and enticing students in real life. They come from a variety of different backgrounds. Um, no, it's not just guys. can be girls as well. And in all those situations, it's about really individuals that are trying to trick another person to give up too much information about themselves. And while we're finding that the internet is a wonderful tool and provides a great opportunity to connect without a deeper understanding about the ramifications of what you're communicating online, you can really disclose too much information about yourself and put yourself, unfortunately, at risk. And moreover, really, the risk of students, right? Because we're dealing with students that have an amazing understanding of technology but lack the maturation to find themselves out of complicated online situations. And so it's our hope that through technology, through curriculum, and through our parents, right, we can help mitigate that from occurring in daily lives. So a little about iSafe. Again, we educate and empower and mobilize students to be safe and responsible online. We do so by providing core curriculum to schools and school districts, 5,100 school districts to be exact, representing 34 million kids domestically. We're talking 35, 36 countries internationally. And I've been at iSafe for the last 10 years working on these respective solutions to create a proactive solution versus a reactive one around internet safety. Some housekeeping. So not only today are we going to learn about the internet landscape, kind of how students think holistically, some internet safety education topics, but you also in your hands have some questionnaire forms. So at any time, right, dot yourself a note, leave yourself a question. We'll collect them about 10 minutes prior to the uh, conclusion of today's presentation, and we'll ask those questions appropriately. If you're just, you know, on this, your seat and you've got to get something out, just raise your hand. I'll do my best to help facilitate that as well. But for the most part, that's why those cards are there in front of you. So again, so that's, our, that's our agenda for today, though, again, so that we can obviously learn and have a broader perspective as it pertains to digital technology. So as we see there, right, we have some, some statistics. I do my best not to read from them because we all can read ourselves. Can we read that OK? Is it too far away? If not, we have some screens on the left and right. But as you can see, right, it shows 20, was it 23% of students, right, that are in nursery school have access to the computer or the internet, and all these are trending up. What is the fastest growing demographic online, though? What is the fastest growing demographic via the web? Senior citizens, correct, right. Not only are they the fastest growing online, they're also the fastest in social media, which is also very interesting. They're also the fastest growing dating population <laughs> online, which also is very fun if you have parents my age. So uh, needless to say, um, as we can see, right, the internet, internet and internet safety, though, is not just precluded to the fact that it's a K through 12 solution, right? It's a home solution. And collectively, we need to think about all the implications. Secondarily, how, do, how often do students connect to the internet, right? Well, we know that students connect not only once a day, but also multiple times a day and primarily because of digital devices, right? Like smartphones, iPads, or other types of technology. And as you can see, these trend lines also, even though they were just of last year, these are also trending up because technology adoption as well as access points are increasing. Also, where do students connect via the web? Well, not only to connect at home, their friend's house, schools, but in today's society, it was a 91% of students have multiple points of access in order to connect to via the web. So again, last year, this was, all, this was down there in 86. So again, this is just goes to prove that with technology adoption, with more opportunities to connect, 
students are using these opportunities to, to actually engage in real life and in a social way. What types of technology do students use? Well, we already know, right? We're seeing a, a severe migration away from traditional portable media like a traditional laptop to technology devices such as iPhones, Galaxies, or other types of smart devices because not only the price point are at a position where kids have access, but secondarily, this is their primary point of actually communicating with their friends in social media. We have, in most cases, students don't even use a traditional computer because they're actually just connecting in these environments and they use these technologies much differently than their own adults. What's it called when a student doesn't make any phone calls but just texts their friends? What do kids call that? Knocking. K-N-O-C-K-I-N-G. We're going to learn like little phraseologies today as well. So it's not just about learning about the technology itself. We're going to also learn about how students communicate about the technology and, and uh, to one another so that we're more knowledgeable about that as well. Where do students go online, right? Well, we already know how adults use the internet, right? We typically use it to gather information, and that's pretty, pretty commonplace. But again, students use technology much differently. They're using it primarily as a social environment or in order to connect with other students. And they continue to do so because they, again, are using this technology as an extension of their real world. And that's really imperative to recognize because we need to, we need to all have a deep understanding about not only their connection but the frequency of those connection points because of the device they have in their hands. What's also interesting, right, 38% have completed an online transaction for book, clothing, and music. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because parents now are providing, at a larger rate than any other time in history, the opportunity to get access to digital wallets or other types of devices that are already pre-configured to make procurements or purchases. So we're going to see this to be even more emphatic over the next three to four years, and I have some fun stories to share about not only some, uh, some Bluetooth solutions that also connect via cell phone devices. Over 400,000 students have participated in this survey, right? And we talk about the three, the big three as they call them, right? 55% of 9th and 12th graders admit to using the internet unsafely, inappropriately, or illegally. 20% have met face to face with someone they first met online. Yikes, right? That's the one that's a bit scary, but sadly, uh, very true. And that statistic, is that trending up or trending down? Down. So today we're not here to fear monger either. We're here to get a clear perception about what's occurring in today's digital space. Last year, 20%. We're starting to see this already trickle down to about 17%. We think this will continue to go down with a deeper knowledge about social media and more over how to connect with friends in real life. We're also seeing a very interesting transition in student, student uh, connections via social media. How many friends does the average student have in a Facebook profile? How many friends does a typical student have? A lot higher. Thanks for guessing. 375. Very good. 375 is the average. How many accounts does the typical student have? We're talking about middle school student. How many typical accounts does a Facebook student have? Three. One for their friends, one for their best friend, and one for mom and dad. Right? That is the normal protocol in today's society. So when you hear accounts like Facebook has, you know, 300, 400, 500 million accounts, it's because multiple accounts are, are a major portion of now their, uh, their environments. And there's some discussion about how that's in inflating their numbers as well. 74% of receipts mean or threatening messages, while the number of connections in real life are going down. Cyberbullying, though, is increasing. And one of the reasons why I'm here today, of course, is because Spring Branch ISD has taken incredible strides, not only in communicating to their students about safe and responsible use, and that of bullying and harassment in order to mitigate those respective concerns. But moreover, right, we have to make sure that collectively we can recognize situations where our students are actually communicating inappropriately to one another, and then communicate that back to the school district that your son or daughter or school that your son or daughter attends so that we can continue to create a safe environment for our kids to be to be, well, nourished, right? To become educated in a safe environment. 75% of high school students have given out personal, personal information. That's no surprise, right? 
That's trending up. 55% know someone who's been bullied online. We already talked about bullying, and that's increasing. And 76% believe they should, they should have the unrestricted right to download music from the internet. The other 24% are just lying, right? <laughs> Teasing aside, the way that we connect to digital music also is changing, such as the new MySpace, which we'll talk about today in our social media section. I know some of you are, are um, going to cause yourself, your hands to, to go into pain as you're trying to draft as, as many of these bullet points, bullet points down. I can tell you after today's presentation, if you just come up to me, grab my card, I will email you this presentation or a link to this presentation so that you don't have to take um, copious notes for today. I promise that we'll make sure that you can take this back. And moreover, we're recording this later, so if you want to see that, um, we'll make that available, right? Thank you. So, next slide, right? 50% of kids and teens associate internet anonymity with freedom. But more importantly, the last bullet point is what I want you to focus on. 25% 25, 25 of kids feel better or more positive about themselves in the online world than in the real world. Why? Anyone want to risk a little? They feel like they're in control. This is a very good point. They can make it up. They can make it up. The internet provides a sense of anonymity. That anonymity, right, can, is transcended through the technology medium, allowing them to be whoever they want to be. And in doing so, they're exploring. They're exploring not only who they are personally, but also ex exploring um, from a variety of different other perspectives. And we have some children in the room, so we can guess what I mean by that. My point is that the internet provides us the opportunity to be someone who we're not, and it's imperative, right, as parents, that we treat the online world as we treat the real world. Both have the same types of rules and regulations, just that how are we going to act appropriately in those respective spaces. So all that data I just provided to you is provided complimentary to Spring Ranch ISD as well as to parents. It's available on the isafe.org website, isafe.org website. And you can continue to get statistics like this because we're constantly updating them using our anonymous assessment engine. And this allows us not only to not only understand how students are thinking, but more of a craft curriculum around the indiscretions or technologies that are using so that educators can feel confident in communicating about how the internet technology is impacting them. I'll take a quick pause there for any questions. All right, we'll continue forward. So today we're going to talk about those kind of five major curriculum topics from cyber citizenship to cybersecurity, personal safety, predator identification, intellectual property. We're going to use them kind of as cornerstones or milestones in our conversation so that we can holistically talk about e-safety education. It's also important you know that those are also the cornerstones in our core curriculum. And so Spring Branch ISD is deploying a solution that will allow them to teach students on those respective topics effectively. All of the core curriculum is grade specific age appropriate for grades K through 12. It's intended for all learning modalities. It's also done with a variety of other ancillary resources like videos, true life stories, PowerPoint presentations, again, in an effort to really engage youth around this respective topic. Because, again, granted, right, we're dealing with amazing understanding of technology leaders, but again, what I say before, uh, lack the maturation, I think I said, right? Out of, out of complicated online situations, and it's really true, because we're dealing with little tiny tykes who will take on a teacher's understanding, and also students who think, like high school students, think that they know more than their teacher, and so it's imperative that we provide them an opportunity to understand how these respective uh, topics can engage them as well. So again, it's meant for all learning modalities, no matter how a student thinks, or their brain biology, because again, we're dealing, right, with frontal lobe thinkers. These are risk takers just in general, because their brains haven't matured yet. And so it's imperative we also recognize that to be the case as well. Secondarily, though, right, we're also dealing with kind of a really interesting juxtaposition because we're dealing with digital natives versus digital immigrants. For those that haven't heard that before, right, we're talking about the mobile M generation as defined by, by the CEO of Qualcomm at CES this past week. Individuals actually grew up with technology devices in their hands versus those that actually picked up technology much later in the way that we use Technology is just, much, is just much different as well. One thing that's driving, though, internet safety education adoption within schools and school districts is some legislation. Now, I know we have some board members here as well, but it's important that from a parent perspective, you recognize that schools and school districts receive a lot of monies in order for, to offset the cost of some of their broadband 
as long as they teach cyberbullying, social networking, and chat room etiquette. So they're mandated through that legislation. And Spring Branch ISD has been on the forefront of that legislation well before it was even institutionalized by participating with ISAFE and receiving the curriculum assets and deploying them. So I can say with great comfort that we're in a unique community because unlike other environments where they're doing catch up in this environment, they've taken steps in order to make sure that when they deploy technology in their hands that they're actually already established and prepared to handle situations like this. Those monies are obviously allocated from a variety of different perspectives, but we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for the largest school district. So there's a significant amount of money that's at risk for those, those recycling environments. But again, in this community, you're in a much better and much more positive situation. So these, again, are the major cornerstones of the core curriculum that's being deployed here at Spring Branch ISD. And so we're going to talk about each of those. I mentioned already that our online world is a lot like our real world in that it requires specific rules and regulations, right? You have to be a certain age before you're able to drive, certain age before you're able to drink. There are also certain rules as it pertains to what platforms or technology devices you can use as well. That legislation is called COPPA, if, you don't, if you're not familiar, the Children's Online Protection Privacy Act, which says that you have to be, let's say, like 13 years of age before you're able to go on Facebook, for instance. So that's why it's really important that we just don't sign our children up for these respective accounts. We recognize that, those, that that legislation is there on purpose so that students are not right, exposing themselves or exposing their personal information so their digital footprint isn't at risk. Digital footprint means that their personal information is not existing on the web and someone's not guarding that information from a marketing perspective learning about our respective child. So we're also going to talk about differentiating between appropriate websites and inappropriate websites so that holistically we can create good positive online citizens because we want them to be informed as they're making and connecting to online. So let's talk about some indiscretions, inappropriate websites. 10,000 hate sites and growing. Trending up or down? Up, right. What month has the most amount of hate sites? December. December, good guess. Anybody else? August, why? Back to school. Interesting, okay. February. Why February? Black History Month. Very good, that's right. So this is, a, this is a time we see a huge increase in the total number of hate sites that come online. The rationalization is Black History Month. These sites are out there to trick students because these sites are essentially profiling kids because everything that a kid sees online they think is Exactly, and that's the reason why we need to teach them positive dis discernment and citizenship so they recognize that everything online is not necessarily true. Multiple sources of information is quite critical, particularly this time of year. These sites like jimlynch.com are set up with kid-friendly games in order to actually create revisionist history that they want children to not only learn but regurgitate in papers. So if you find yourself as a teacher, the teachers that are in here, in those environments, um, this, is a, this is a good time of year to make sure that students actually put together a bibliography of where they got that information because this is a, this is a quite common occurrence. How-to sites. Can someone give me a how-to site? Most commonly heard, right, how to make a bomb, right? Any others? Freaking for note takers, P-H-R-E-A-K-I-N-G. Anyone heard about freaking? So freaking is a very popular 2012 exercise. It's not the dance, by the way. Freaking is when you manipulate technology to do something it wasn't intended to do. A good example is a vending machine. You take a dollar bill, stick it between two pieces of cellophane tape, and you run it through a vending machine. That dollar bill goes into the belly of the machine. You pull it out with that tape. It will cause the machine to void, dumping out all of its inventory and all of its change. This is, of course, is seen online and then replicated in those respective environments. Typically schools, because those vending machines are usually older in nature, so it's easier, they're, they're easily checked upon. Another freaking technique for those sites that still have pay phones outside of campus because they have a mobile-free environment, which isn't too, too common here. But what students will do is actually take a recording device of a quarter being dropped into the belly of a cell phone, replay that over the handset, 
and old antiquated pay phones will actually allow an outbound phone call to go out without being charged for it. These are good examples of how-to sites that have kind of transcended the whole how to make a bomb scenario. Are we learning things now? We good? Web aside. What is web aside? Web assisted suicide. Now these sites are growing in popularity, particularly after Ryan Halligan, who was bullied, tormented by his, well, by his bully, he decided to actually take his own life. And in the PowerPoint presentation, I'll include a video, a five minute video of his dad coming to us, explaining the story about his son and his perpetrator. And it's a, it's a very telling, I elected not to do that because I knew we might have some children here, but this is a great for middle school, high school students to see as well. And it's included in our assembly experiences. Besides website, we have Anna and Mia sites. Anyone ever been to, ever heard about Anna and Mia? Anorexia and bulimia. So students will call these Anna and Mia, and the phraseology typically is, I played with Anna this weekend. That whole phrase is a, is a typical assessment of someone that actually is participating in some level of anorexia. These are done via status wall. And those, does anyone know how to search Facebook status walls? OK, so let's talk about that. So there's a couple ways you can, you can search status walls, right? So one is myopenbook.com. It's a site that allows you to search open pages. You can actually type phrases like this. And in doing so, you can actually then identify a specific geography. So if you're looking for something specific, you're able to do that. The new Facebook social graph also allows you to do a, a variety of searches based upon your friendships. So this may, when they start opening up the language, um, it's going to be interesting to see how that's also going to play a role. But again, these are sites that are typically associated with inappropriateness and moreover an opportunity for you to identify maybe something that's occurring um, in your respective environment. Gambling. Who gambles more, middle school or high school students? Middle. middle school students. That's right. What percentage of middle school students have gambled online? 78%. Right. What's their game of choice? Blackberry. Texas Hold'em. Very good. Glamorized by ESPN. Posted online, students typically start by playing for free. They then earn flus. What is flus? Digital currency. Fake digital currency, also called e-coins. Kids call it flus. They then convert that flus into hard capital by parlaying the respective money that they've earned by playing online. I've got two kids out of Connecticut this year that did $250,000 in real revenue from online gambling this year. So this is a significant opportunity for students to, um, to participate in if, they're, if they can be successful in these types of games. In both situations, there's a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old that, uh, that have done really well in those types of environments, which are completely inappropriate for kids, as we all know. Drugs. Drugs purchased online. Are drugs purchased online? Come on. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Illegal drugs? No. Very difficult. Pharmaceutical drugs, right? Pharmaceutical drugs are purchased from, from what country, typically? I heard it back over here. Canada, correct. Right, very good. Top three pharmaceutical drugs that are purchased by middle school. One can cost you high school, so let's say ninth grade. Top three drugs that are purchased by ninth graders. No, no. Xanax, Oxycontin, Viagra, <laughs> stick, <laughs> no they don't need it, thank you, <laughs> stick all three in a candy dish, go to a party, what type of party did you just go to, who said that by the way, that's an excellent answer, yeah, because no one usually gets that, that's, you're totally dialed in. Skittling party, skittle party, because they're all different colors and shapes. The other, farm party, P-H-A-R-M party, is what's called. Skittling is the new emerging trend or statement that students are using, though, to constitute a party that has those. And again, typically picked up by hand, tossed in your mouth, 
with a uh, carefree on actually what they're ingesting. Alcohol purchased online. No. Yeah. Why? Strange, right? Because alcohol requires a parental signature. Pharmaceutical drugs do not. Strange, I know. But what we're seeing now also is like organizations like Sky Vodka are creating sites like the old Joe Camel methodology in order to go download the latest tracks from their underground DJ. They'll have to go to Sky Vodka, lie about their age in order to get entrance, and then be able to download the track of their favorite artist and download the MP3 so they can stick it on their mobile device or their smartphone with some technology. So we're seeing kind of alcohol play a very interesting role in that, in that methodology now. And then pornography of all forms, and I'll, uh, I'll refrain from communicating about the indiscretions that occur from that perspective because of the mixed company in the room. But as you can imagine, that comes in all different shapes and sizes and frequencies. Moreover, not only is it about just inappropriate websites and how students can get access, it's also about bullying or harassment online. I mentioned earlier that when I, was, when I used to work at the FBI, it was all about predation. People seducing, luring, enticing them to meet in real life. It would typically start back in the day in, well, a chat room. They find common interests. Those common interests haven't changed, though. Top three common interests by boys are? Sports, cars, girls, right? Top three interests by girls that girls talk about. Boys, boys, bo no, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> boys, fashion, very good, other girls, right? And so this is a good example, though, of how bullying kind of plays that respective role, because it's all about communicating about other people in these, in these spaces. So what is cyberbullying, if we don't know? It's the bullying and harassing of, of others online, typically using... The, the veil of an anonymity that the web provides in order to communicate either one-to-one -one or in group form around, around about another respective individual. Typically done, right, for power control or just to modify human relationships that are occurring on those respective campuses. It's not atypical for me to hear about schools and school districts where individuals are actually um, garnering other people's cell phone devices in order to send text messages that are inappropriate to another individual as part of a bullying strategy that some schools and school districts unfortunately have experience. So in all these situations though, if you find yourself in an environment where your child's being um, bullied again, go back to the school district administrator or the, or the principal in order to get support in order to mitigate this. I can tell you that Spring Branch ISD has an AUP policy, simply use policy that's very rigorous and will help you navigate around the landmines of cyberbullying if this ever does come to your, for, come to your footsteps. Again, the Constitution, though, what's really important, right? It protects free speech, but if the bullying and harassment has a direct threat of physical harm, that is, someone says something about creating bodily injury, you have every right to go directly to law enforcement. And law enforcement has a reg that they have to follow in order to assist you in those processes. So that is, should, your, should be your litmus test. If there's a direct threat of bodily harm, Boom, directly go to law enforcement in order, in order to get support in order to have these situations mitigated. Again, the, the major differences between bullying and, and online bullying really is about anonymity, off school property, and unlike traditional bullying, which occurred you know, within the hours of the day, within the bell schedule, online bullying does not. It just doesn't stop. One, two, three in the morning, your child's receiving text messages. That's why we always encourage that parents actually take technology and move it to a central location in the evening, not only for their own health, but in, in situations such as this as well, to ensure that that communication is not impacting the normal sleep patterns. It might sound silly on the forefront, but I can tell you that with the frequency of cyberbullying occurring in city society, that, uh, that this is a, a very good tactic in order to help mitigate or shield your son or daughter from experiencing these phone calls late at night. Yes? The number of times you mentioned anonymity. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So the question in the back, so if you didn't hear, was about anonymity and actually trying to define anonymity, not only for the sake of does the web provide a veil of anonymity per, um, holistically, or is it that students actually seek out an environment 
to be anonymous to make those respective communications? And the answer is both. One, it's very easy for any child right now to create a rogue or fake Facebook profile account. In today's society, that's typically how bullying starts. So a child creates a fake Facebook account, unbeknownst to Facebook, of course. In California, they have a state statute that you actually can't create a fake social media account, and if you're caught, you're actually punishable by, by, by law, and that state's uh, AB 503. Different than here in Texas, though, right? Because you're actually working on your social media legislation um, for your 2012-2013, which would be 2013-2014 uh, methodology. Regardless, right, in those situations where students have created fake accounts, it's, it's practically impossible to identify the respective recipient. And then you're kind of waiting, right, for them to draw that line. That is, was there a threat of bodily injury so that you can contact law enforcement to have what they call, and this is not to get too down in the weeds, a preservation order request. A preservation order request is required by law enforcement to actually go in there and actually have the count screened, if not screened, put to the side so they can continue to move forward with a traditional warrant of some capacity. So when I talk about anonymity, I'm actually referring to both. Both the, the opportunity that the, the, the web is just in itself anonymous, but holistically, kids can actually find themselves in environments to create anonymity if they're trying to do something that's inappropriate. Good question. Thank you. Again, bullying takes shapes in a variety of different perspectives, from angry, offensive, and insulting messages and IMs to just really the repetition. The repetition is the key, though, unlike traditional bullying. This just is frequently nonstop digital communications as it pertains to um, their their spirit. And you know, what are the top three things girls are bullied about? I mentioned girls twice now because typically it's girls that are bullied, by the way. Their appearance, very good. Typically they're white, right? If not, it's about their relationships, and those relationships can exist on the, the relationship with their boyfriends or their relationships within their own girl social network or the girl network. Students also can bully through a variety of different technologies. That's also what's different about bullying is that it's not just uniformly text message, right? It can be through social media. It can be done through instant messaging. It can be done through email from a variety of different means so that those messages are constant and repetitious. And not to be repetition myself, right? I just want to make sure you understand the complexities of how bullying can occur. So pretty much ISD has, has really made a difference. Not only are they are the forefront leaders, right, the innovators of being progressive leaders on how they're not only combating bullying situations, but they're also leaders because they're taking a proactive stance in order to mitigate these from occurring on campus. First, they established an acceptable use policy that was disseminated to all parents. Secondarily, they're constantly reviewing that respective AUP to ensure that those environments um, and any new technologies that might come to the forefront are going to be included in the next iteration. They've also created a walled environment so that students can feel comfortable in their communications with one another. That is, when little tiny tykes can't email back and forth. They can only email their teachers, and only within certain hours within a day. And they did so all under the safety guidelines to ensure that parents feel comfortable with how technology is being utilized on your respective campuses. This is really critical. And actually, why I put it here is, as being a, a progressive environment, because not all schools and school districts have taken the time, the energy, and the effort to identify the appropriateness as it pertains to one-to-one -one communication. So that's something you, your community should be extremely proud of. On the second side, the right, it's not only about what has current, occurred right now, but also about what you can do within your own homes, right? We want to encourage traditional technology adoption. And by doing so, we want to, at the home, also make sure that we've taken steps to help mitigate this. Because we don't want what happens at the home to impact right, what's happening at the school or school district if there's some inappropriate content, for example. Now, there's a variety of different topics that we're going to go over now from a technology perspective. The deck's a little longer than the amount of time that we have allocated, so I'm going to kind of go through um, some of these quite quickly, because some of these might be, uh, you might know some of these technologies actually off the top of your head. And so, therefore, we can get something that's a little more formidable about actually what students are experiencing today. First, of course, is Twitter. Twitter is an increasing social media technology that schools are adopting. But moreover, right, we're finding more and more students, particularly in the high school genre, using Twitter as a, as a primary form of communication, even more so than traditional Facebook or other social media environments. For those that actually don't know the top social media solution providers, I wanted to list them here so you could actually see that most of them, right, 
If it's not blogging, it's all about social media. So in other words, it's all about connecting with other people in the online world. This is a, a good example of that. And that, by the way, that's MySpace is the new MySpace that already has 126 million users. If you're not familiar with the new MySpace, it's new.myspace.com. It's a music site now that's completely different than the old MySpace because there's no actually connecting with profiles. It's all about exploring music and one that's actually quite interesting. We also have Wikipedia that's been adopted by Spring Batch ISD because, of course, we're trying to create environments where students understand where technology, not only technology, but also definitions come from, not only just traditional definitions, but also user-generated content in those environments. So Wikipedia plays a role, particularly in the middle school and high school area, because, again, we're trying to get students to participate in media in a way that's different than just accepting the norms or realms that it's, it's uh, one way. So making it bilateral is the way that we can look at just traditional wiki environments. Some social media environments you should know. BWA.com. BWA.com is what? The number one website in the United Kingdom. BlackPlanet.com, number one website amongst the African American community. Classmates.com, number one social media site within 35 to 40 year olds. Facebook.com, Number one or number two social media site for middle school students? Number two now. Yeah, they lost their top spot. To that little company at the bottom there, Tumblr. Tumblr is growing in popularity for middle school students. And if you're not familiar with Tumblr, you should check it out. Because this is the technology. This is why you come to events like this, so you can actually learn to see what's on the forefront and what are kids actually connecting with. Again, students have actually migrated away from just updating statuses to the sharing of pictures. That's why Instagram was so huge, and now we're seeing another transition into video environments like Tumblr, so that it can blog, they can post pictures and post videos, an environment that allows them outside the constraints of just their traditional friends. So again, we mentioned all this already, um, but not only, again, the AUP policies, not only as it pertains to the deployment of new technologies, but Spring Branch is wanting your support, your parental support, that is, what is it you can do in your respective homes in order to make sure that content stays there that's in appropriate nature, and that is only through right, creating digital citizenships in the home. So it's imperative, again, we can communicate to our son and daughter about appropriate content and how that content can impact other people in our society. Because, again, it's about what type of content is available in these environments. These stats are pretty interesting because just in general, right, they identify just the complexities of what, t how frequent and what type of personal information is being captured from social media sites like Facebook, right, from first name to last name to posted friends. This should give you a clear example of what students are actually doing and what type of personal information they're actually sharing. What you also might find interesting, though, is just how these accounts are being kind of uh, communicated or the frequency for which they're being um, institutionalized. 71% of girls, 58% of boys, that's 15, 17 years of age, and 35% of adults now have an online profile. These are all increasing. What's also interesting, right, is that regardless of geography, socioeconomic, race, religion, th those stats have a lot of parity. So it's not just one group that's actually increasing this res those respective statistics. Now, what are the top four concerns as a parent regarding social media? First and foremost, jobs. That is, students, particularly internships, right? Finding more and more organizations, not just the big Fortune 500, more and more organizations are looking at social media profiles to identify if your son or daughter should be allowed to work as an intern at that respective organization, that company. Secondarily, we're looking at education advancement. Colleges and universities now have, have joined the ranks of identifying someone specifically for social media screening. We had a situation just last year, right? A young man graduated from high school, class of champagne in hand, outside of his limo, accepted to an Ivy League school. That Ivy League school was rescinded once they received the social, they saw a social media site where he was drinking because it was outside the purviews of their terms of service. And they, again, took away his opportunity to go to that university. So, 
I think it's imperative that we think about how our actions online can have some clear consequences on what we're trying to accomplish holistically in life. Blackmarket.coms. There are a new set of organizations that are out there that are just gleaming or taking digital copies of open social media sites like Facebook. So if you post a picture on Facebook, you thought you deleted it, well guess what? It might not be deleted. It might be existing in another organization's database. And it's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you $100 per picture to have it removed from their respective database. So that's why it's imperative that we talk to students about the type of information they also post in those environments so they can recognize that it can have a clear, um, they have a clear digital footprint. And lastly, rogue accounts, which we talked about pretty extensively as it pertains to cyberbullying. And those are accounts that are generated specifically in order to actually just harass other students in those environments. Some smartphone apps you should know about that are, that are growing in popularity within the student population. One, Ugly Meter app. The Ugly Meter app essentially is you take a picture of your friend in a not so pleasing pose, you post it up to a virtual community, and you have them rate their looks. You then create that, um, it will identify from a rating perspective how, uh, how attractive they are. And then typically the rating then is used in a rogue account, rogue Facebook account, as part of a long, a bigger, broader kind of cyber bull you to change your phone number prior to sending it out so it hides your phone number so that the person can't identify who's actually calling them in the middle of the evening, texting them in the middle of the night. Facebook Poke, anyone familiar with that? New application by Facebook allows you to send a picture that will self-destruct in 10 seconds from the time it's delivered so that there will be no one that will be able to identify the evidence of it occurring. It had a big upswing and then quick downfall because of the next app, which I'm sure we've heard about in the press, Snapchat, which is growing extensively in popularity. It's um, taking off. It reminds me a lot kind of at Instagram's first kind of inclination within schools. Snapchat, again, takes a, you can take a picture of yourself, send it to a friend, and that friend will have 10 seconds to view prior to the image being deleted. It's typically used in sexting environments. And sexting, of course, is sex texting or, or uh, taking a picture of yourself nude or inappropriately clothed or in a suggestive position to, a, to uh, typically a significant other. Some other sites you should know about, East Spin the Bottle, Face the Jury, Hot or Not, Hot or Not is the most popular on that list, all on the rating kind of genre. Again, sites that are out there specifically in order to uh, pick up on bullying techniques. <coughs> and then I also want to put some of the new kind of virtual worlds that are, t are making some headlines and some MMORPGs. These are multi-online role-playing games. And these games are all in intended to create um, an opportunity for, ki for people to connect with real life, but in a, in a mobile environment. So two things that you should look at here. First, secondlife.com used to be a huge technology, um, kind of not as popular anymore. But if you want to understand what a virtual world should, should look like and what it, how, it, how it interacts, you should try to install secondlife.com. It's very beautiful, very visual, provides an opportunity to uh, actually create your own intellectual property through widgets. You can make yourself, I know this might sound a little odd, but you can actually create yourself a, um, a digital hammer out of their widget tools, and you would actually own the intellectual property. When Barack Obama was running for his first term, two girls out of Ohio created a Barack Obama virtual t-shirt within Second Life. They were able to sell $40,000 worth of virtual t-shirts in this respective space, and they sold their trademark for that t-shirt for $200,000 to a traditional t-shirt manufacturer, which continued to move that on. So there are some interesting um, opportunities just from a business perspective as well. On the uh, massive online role-playing games, World of Warcraft, listed as the number one reason why boys drop out of college this past year, right? At 23% of all dropouts associated directly with World of Warcraft play, which is kind of interesting as well. So the highly addictive, the goal there is to level up and to continue to create virtual coins 
or goods. Um, what's interesting about these environments, I'll let you read these stats behind me, is that there was a uh, UK banker last year where two kids out of New Jersey worked together in tandem where they would continue to increase their, their, this would be their level, their experience level. And by doing so, they're able to uh, create a character, an avatar, to have um, a, a superior um, opportunity to make purchases. Those two New Jersey boys uh, made $550,000 last year by selling their avatar, that is their fake virtual player, to this banker in the UK because he didn't want to start the game from the very beginning. <laughs> so, again, what, what we're talking about here, no, we're talking like 24 hour, 24 seven, li literally. The boys would take shifts in order to continue to level up or to change the rank of this respective, and it took them about four and a half months of continuous play to actually get to that point. For those South Park fans in here, they actually had an episode specifically about those two boys, which is kind of also uh, humorous in its own intent. Some, uh, some acronyms you should know. I'll take, let you take a quick peek while I'm taking a drink of water. Any look familiar? Like POTS? Parents over the shoulder? Right, P911? That's them solved for you. There's a list that's updated at isafe.org that we change readily about once every uh, three, four months to keep you up to speed on the acronyms that students are communicating to one another. Is this how students are actually talking, though? No. They've now changed to what's called leet speak. Looks like um, a dot matrix printer gone wild, right? I mean, what is going on? So let's just take one. Um, let's take I safe. The exclamation mark is a upside down I. The five is the shape of an S. The four is in the one-legged A. The pound sign is an F. The three is a backwards E. So in class, if those teachers out there don't know what the heck they're actually reading, you go, to Google, go to Google, type in Leet Speak Translator, type it in there, it'll convert it for you. So you can actually see how students are actually communicating back and forth. We have about five minutes left. There's about hmm, ten, 10 or so slides. We'll save that for home if, if you guys would like. Well, uh, if you have any questions, start passing them towards the middle aisle, and I'll start talking about some digital technology you should be on the forefront and looking at. So I have a tendency to travel internationally for my job, luckily, to, uh, to places that talk about technology and technology adoption. Some new technologies that came out of CES, though, this year out of Las Vegas that you should know about which are kind of interesting because they came out last year on mobile devices, is that my, uh, my, my little G3S here has got a special chip inside. It's got a, a, a payment solution chip from a Deutsch company that allows me to have a virtual wallet that's baked into this, my device. I was walking through um, this demo area within CES and I received a text message. You want to guess where the text message derived from, where it came from? came from a vending machine. The vending machine asked if I was thirsty. I walked a little further away. It then offered me a discount on my soda pop. I was able to press the T button, which is purchased for this phone. It then debited my credit card and out popped my soda pop. They anticipate this type of technology to come out in the US probably 2018. So you know, we're talking today a lot about cyber citizenship, cyber harassment, online predation. But now we have to think about really digital literacy in the upcoming years, understanding how people can get your phone number, what type of communications are coming from them, how to discern advertising versus that of traditional communication. So we're just really on the forefront about what's going to happen in today's society. Some also kind of interesting technology that rolled out you should know about, mobile romance. Anyone familiar with mobile romance? Mobile romance allows you to, um, to identify that you're looking for someone. So let's say I'm looking for a 30-year-old female brunette, likes to play soccer and eat apples. <laughs> Very specific, I know. Text message me when she's within 50 meters of my location with a 90% probability. That's the type of technology that's coming out. So if you can imagine this put in the hands about someone looking for, um, you know, 
other individuals of different age groups, you can really put in perspective now how the technology can be used inappropriately. So again, we need to think about holistically about what we can do as parents in order to ensure that our kids are safe online, but moreover recognize that a technology will continue to adapt, and so we need to adapt as parents as well. I think we're ready for some questions. Yes. Do you recommend any key logging or nanny software? Good question. So interesting as, as, the, as I say for the nonprofit, we are on the proactive side of the business, right? We want to make sure that we understand what it means to be safe, responsible online, and moreover provide core curriculum attributes so that students can, uh, can be safe and responsible in that respect to measure. From a parent perspective, though, you're kind of stuck, right? Because you want to make sure that, one, you open your lines of communication, you communicate effectively to your respective children about, or, uh, about appropriateness, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you've institutionalized policies or, importantly, applications to help you through that process. So if you're looking for a social media solution, I can tell you there's a couple out there that are, that are pretty good. Um, TrueCare is a, is a good example of that. TrueCare is an application set that allows you to, um, people like to say, monitor, social media monitoring versus spying, right, in order to create the conversation, create alertable moments based on specific um, statements they might make. Anna and Mia, for example, might be a good one. Um, and others that are um, just looks at content holistically for filtering. Um, Blue Coat, Bitdefender, good examples of that. Both are good applications. Um, and I think that's probably where I would start um, as a parent. Um, in all these environments, though, I can tell you that homegrown collaboration and communication is the way to go. Because inevitably, even when you install these software solutions, you're going to put yourself, you're always going to find yourself in a situation where they're going to have unfettered, instantaneous access to content that's just inappropriate in nature, and you're going to want to make sure you have that conversation sooner than later so they understand how to act responsibly.